Greetings, beloved, and welcome to Going Deeper. This week, we are going to take a journey, Dr. Chris Green and I, down the road of Mark's Gospel, Chapter 1, where Jesus, coming out of the waters of baptism, enters into 40 days and 40 nights of temptation. So I want you to open your heart as Dr. Chris and I begin to talk. Dr. Chris, when we look at the Markan account, uh, which is the earliest account we have right. of the four Gospels, knowing that Mark, as we are told by historians, is telling Peter's story, so Mark becomes the voice of Peter. Right. There are things that Mark wants us to understand, that Peter wants us to understand about the Jesus he knows and the story he tells. Yeah. And Mark kind of puts everything in a compact sort of a way. And so we've got John the Baptist heralding, you know, that he's the voice crying in the wilderness. And then here comes Jesus. He gets in the waters of baptism. He has a profoundly mystical experience. And following that experience of the voice of the Father's affirmation, approbation, and confirmation of his mission, he's driven Yes. He's driven yes. into the wilderness to be tested. Yes. And, and it goes on to say that not only is he tested by the devil, but he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Absolutely. So I'd, I'd like us to take a journey through that and, and then allow the, the saints that are watching to live into that text in their own journey. Yeah. So I, I think one of the things to say right up front is that Mark is doing something different from Matthew and Luke altogether. Obviously, they're telling the same story, but they're not only telling it from a different perspective, but they're addressing different dimensions of Jesus' experience. Yeah, talk about that a little so bit. So I think one, one, one of my friends has put it this way. I think it's really helpful. And if you had four you know, great pieces of art, you know, a Van Gogh and Picasso, whatever, you know, your, whatever it is you happen to find lovely, you wouldn't want to cut pieces of those four and make a new piece, a fifth piece, that had a, an aspect of each of them. You, you want to honor them by allowing them to remain themselves. But in our preaching and teaching, we often mash the Gospels up into a kind of hypothetical fifth Gospel that or represents... you. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that, that tells the story of Jesus with all of the pieces refitted together. But I think we lose something really important about Mark's witness and John's witness and Luke's witness when we make a new gospel of our own devising mm -hmm. that pieces all of that together. So I think we have to avoid that. And in fact, the early church rejected that explicitly. There's a, a move to, to make a, what is essentially a fifth gospel that lines it all up. And the church says, no, we don't want that. And it doesn't become canonized. It's these four gospels in their individuality that's canonized. And I, I think that's important. And so, Mark, one of the differences is in, in Luke and Matthew, it takes a while to get to the temptations. And the baptism is separated from the temptations by a chapter break, both in Matthew and in Luke. So we read the story of the baptism, we stop, the curtain comes down and comes up again, and now we're in the wilderness, right? But in Mark's gospel, it's immediate. You're just a few verses in, and you're already in the wilderness with Jesus. I mean, his clothes are still wet, and the Father's voice is still echoing yeah. while he's in the wilderness. And another difference is Mark does not enumerate the temptations. You know, so in Matthew and Luke, there are three temptations, but Mark does not work those details. He simply says he was tempted for 40 days. And afterward, He's with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. But even though Mark's account is compressed, he is the most detailed. He offers details that no other gospel writer offers. And he offers details, small details, but details that echo all of these various events from Israel's history. Now, obviously, it's the wilderness wandering. I mean, Israel's time in the desert. It's also obviously, the exodus, although here's the difference, right? So in Israel's exodus, both when they leave Egypt and when they leave the wilderness to go into the promised land, the waters part and they go through on dry ground. But when Jesus comes to the waters, the waters do not part. Mm -hmm. He goes down into them. And Bob Ekblad has talked about what that signals is that Jesus is going down with Pharaoh and his armies. My, He's not going through my. with the people. 
He's, yeah, now he's, you just flipped the narrative. You, you, <laughs> well, I, I don't think I did. I think the Gospels did. <laughs> yeah, right. no, but I, I'm just I'm anticipating how people are going to try to all of a sudden their brains are going to go on fire. So Absolutely. talk about talk about that. Yeah, it's so really I, important. It is. And I think all of these events that the Gospel, Mark, that we're talking about now draws together. Jesus is reliving history, reliving Israel's history, which is a history for the sake of the world. Right. But he's reliving it differently. All right, so in Israel's wandering in the wilderness, obviously they receive manna and quail, even though that wasn't originally the plan, and water from a rock. But Jesus does is, not. He's right. And he doesn't turn water, stones to bread, bread. And he doesn't exactly. drink water from a rock. Exactly. So he's Jesus in the wilderness without signs. Right. And not only does he not ask for signs, he refuses to make a sign of himself. Right. That's one of the temptations is throw yourself down and it'll be revealed that you are truly the son of God. So he won't ask for a sign and he won't make a sign of himself. So in that way, it's different. In, in the passing through the water though, by going down in it rather than it opening wide, he is showing solidarity with all of those people who were lost in the flood and all of those people who are destroyed in the crashing of the Red Sea. Okay, so when Peter talks about yes. when he harrows hell that, that's to what those this is that about. are in prison, Mm. Oh my goodness! Right, he he, oh he goes into the goodness. heart of it. So the way that Paul Paul talks about this, right, is that the one who ascended first descended to the lowest parts of the earth. So that if you if you can just visualize this, right, Christ is the one who comes from on high, goes to the absolute lowest point of creation, and claims everything from from that height to that depth as his. And that's why Paul says in Romans eight. Nothing can separate us, neither height nor depth. Nor depth. So it, in, in going down into the waters of baptism, rather than passing through the waters, Jesus is saving not only Israel, but, but Egypt. He's claiming Jew and Gentile, which is the heart of the gospel, right? That, that all of us are claimed, those who were near and those who were far off, you know, those who were on the shore and those who were in the depths. And, and he claims all of that. And it, yes, I mean, this... Again, this is what the Gospels are saying, right? This is not Powerful. this is not my reading of the Gospels. I mean, this is what the Gospels are saying. Okay, so so now with that in mind, he has just okay. So talk to me about the fact that thou art my beloved son. Um, why would he need that if he knows that? Well. I don't know if need is the word. Okay. I think we need it. Yeah. I think it's it's not so much need as it's what's true. Right? It's it's what's true of him. So I don't think he needs I don't think there's a lack in Jesus that is filled up by hearing that he's beloved. Okay. But I, although I think there's a lack in us. Yes. But I think that is coming true in the world and it's time for that to be announced, right? And then it gets said again at before the, cross. the transfiguration right. before the cross. So I I think but that also is an echo of Israel's history because Israel's kings, beginning with David, are called the beloved. The beloved. Right? And Psalm 2 and other texts refer to the king as the son of God. Right. So when he's called the beloved the son of God, in some ways that's an announcement that the he's messianic, Messiah. Right. He's the, the messianic king. messianic announcement. But of course we know, and the gospel writers know, that he's a son by nature, not by grace. Right. Like he's not a son like David was a son. He's the Lord David was talking about. Right. He's, he's the Lord to which David defers. Right, Psalm 110. So he's the king of kings, right? So there's a way in which even that detail, it's calling up Israel's history, history. of kingship, but it's calling it up differently, that he's a different kind of king. Israel, my firstborn. Out of Egypt, I've called him, right? right. So, and Matthew tells us that explicitly. That's why Jesus goes into Egypt, right? It, fleeing for his life. So Jesus is, the, the theological term for it, he's, is he's recapitulating the history. He's living it again to bring it about to a new end, to bring about something from it that couldn't have been accomplished otherwise. And, and that's why he insists on being baptized. So the church fathers say that Jesus is baptized not to wash away sin because he's sinless. He's baptized in order to sanctify the water to wash away our sins. My, my. So what happens, and this, this is a critical point, nothing happens to God. God happens to everything. Everything else. So when Jesus has these experiences, he's not being changed by them. He's changing everything else. So John needs to baptize Jesus, not because Jesus lacks something he needs, 
But John needs to be the baptizer. He needs that experience of being in the, in the role of caring for Jesus and, and declaring this. And so Jesus submits to that and, and so on through, through Jesus' experience. Okay, I want I, I, not, to, not, not to leave this passage, but this, this just thought, it just dawned on I me, mean, the care for the body of Jesus at the cross becomes supremely important. Absolutely. How do we handle, you know, we'll talk about that later, but, but I mean, that becomes significant in light of what you just said. So the goal is God has created human beings to rule the earth. I mean, our, our calling as human beings is to mediate the holiness of God to the rest of creation and to mediate creation to God. That, that's our role. That's why in communion, we don't bring grapes and grain. We bring bread, bread and, and wine. wine. We're bringing the creation up into the fullness of God. We're, we're humanizing the earth and humanizing creation. This is what sacrifice is about. We're, we're, we're bringing life to creation. We often tell sacrifices as if it's about death, but that's, the Eucharist reveals that's not true. It's about, it's about life. So there's that movement. But also we are mediating God to the rest of creation. We're bringing God's holiness to bear. So what I think is happening with Jesus' life is he keeps putting himself in a position where we have to care for him so we will rise into our calling as the priests and prophets of the earth. And he, he serves us and he washes our feet, but there are times he lets us wash his body, not because he needs that, but we need that. We need the, the care for him and that he, he's a God who puts himself at our mercy so we can learn what his mercy is. Why, why, why do you suppose right now, even in the 21st century church, these are not conversations we're having in our popular tribes as Pentecostals and Charismatics? Why? That would take a lot of time, but I, I think there are two profound mistakes that we've made that, that have long-term effects and we're reaping a harvest that was sown a long time ago. The first one is we, in the midst of the controversies after the Reformation, there was a, a press for simplicity. We need truth to be simple. We need everything that's really important. We need it to be simple and accessible to everybody. And, you know, historically it makes sense why people would have felt that need. But what that ended up doing, the, the long-term unintended consequences of that, is that we came to believe that the more true something is, the shallower it is, the simpler it is, the more obvious it is. And that's just not who God is, that's right. not who human beings are, and that's not what scripture is. So the long-term effects of that, you know, we, we say all the time that scripture is plain, you know, scripture is simple, to preach the gospel in a way that a child can understand it. But if you go back and read scripture, that's not actually what Jesus did. Right. That's not actually what the apostle Paul or prophet Isaiah did. And I think it was well-intentioned, but I think it was a disastrous mistake. And I think it cost us, it's costing us now because we come to scripture without any sense of that depth, without any sense of the, the ways in which it's layered with complexity. So that, I think that's one of the consequences. The other was we, ma we made the assumption that the goal of ministry is to convert people to Christianity. Instead of seeing that's the beginning of ministry, not the end. You've not accomplished the goal. You've started the process at that point. So we, we reversed the order in, in a way that I think also has enormous negative effects, long-term long effects. I know, I would imagine it affects the way we read the scripture too. Absolutely. Okay, so in Mark now, we have this entry into an identification with Israel in the wilderness. 40 days, period of probation, mm -hmm. yeah, testing, testing like the 40 yep. years. Yep. But then he, and he clearly in writing this presupposes that his audience is going to understand what he's saying. Absolutely. Now we are 2,100 years removed from when Mark wrote this. So we need to stop and take a look. Mark, why at the end of the 40 days, well, when you get there, then do you say, and he was with the wild beasts yeah. and the angels were menacing? Yeah. What, what, so what are we supposed to understand? This, this one, I think... It's obvious once you see it, but it's easy to miss. It's when you, you think about the details that we've been given, right? There's water, there are angels, there are wild beasts, there's a dove that settles. All of that is a reference to the Noah story, right? So remember the, the heavens open, 
the, the water descends, rises up from the earth. You know, the, there's a, this great flood. It rains for 40 days. Right. Right. At the end of the of the period, Noah starts releasing birds, first a raven and then dove. Right. And finally, the dove does not come back right. because it's rested on new creation. So when Jesus comes up out of the flood and the heavens are open and the dove descends on him, he's the new creation. He is the new creation. This, the world has been made new, right? But then he immediately goes to the wilderness. And this is a surprise because you think of the, the flood as the moment in which we, we've reached the end of the story, right? All of this trouble, God came, saved us from the trouble. But Mark is very careful to make sure we don't think that's what's happening. Jesus comes up out of the water, the dove settles on him, and immediately Mark says he's driven into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days by the devil and is with the wild beast and he's ministered to by angels. And I think that detail about with the wild beasts is, is, the, is the clearest clue that what's going on with Jesus is not what happened with Noah. So if we go back to the Noah story for a moment, we don't know that story nearly as well as we think we right. do. Right? We've given it a kind of superficial read. And even though it's a story of the death of almost the whole creation, we somehow hear it as a happy tale, right? Noah is saved and his, and his family and some of the animals. But what we often miss is what happens after Noah comes off the ark. So one of the ways that I, I've talked about this before is we, we think we know the story of Noah's ark, A-R-K, but we know almost nothing about the story of Noah's A-R-C, the ark the trajectory, of his life, the trajectory. trajectory. And this is true of almost all of our readings of Scripture. We know Scripture stories, and I mean, when I say we here, I'm talking about the Christians in my circles. We know kind of Wikipedia versions or yeah. veggie tale versions yeah, yeah, yeah. of the gospel stories or biblical stories, but we don't know the ark of the stories. Right. So one example is the prodigal son story. When we hear that story, we think of a story of reconciliation. But if you go back and read the story, it's a story in, in which a reconciliation happens that leads to a greater splintering. So when the son goes away and comes home again, there's joy. But what happens With from that point brother. is you, where we end the story, we've got a son inside of a party who won't come out exactly. for his brother or his father. We've got a father who leaves one son to go to the other. He's already done that once. Now he does it in reverse. And we've got another brother who won't go in with the father to the son. They end in absolute estrangement. Yeah. And so it's a story not about reconciliation, but about how even reconciliation can break a family if they don't want it. Right? That this, and, and, and this is why they want to kill Jesus after he tells this parable. Right? It's, it's, they, they don't sing and dance and, and have a revival, they want to kill him because it's offensive, right? And that's, that's true of almost every story in Scripture that we think we know. And so in the Noah story, he comes off the ark and offers the sacrifice. And up to that point, everything in Noah's story, he sounds like Abel. In fact, again and again, the words are used to remind us of Abel in the beginning. Abel finds favor with God because of his sacrifice, which is a sacrifice of animals. Noah finds favor in God's sight and makes a sacrifice of animals, just, just exactly like Abel. And God makes a covenant, never again will I destroy the earth. And then we get something we could not have expected. And that is the text, the text says, and Noah was a man of the soil, which is the exact same phrase that's used for Cain. Right. And inexplicably, suddenly, the man who was righteous, the only righteous man on the earth, the, the only one who could have saved the world, becomes the new Cain without a Satan, a serpent to tempt him. He just suddenly is like Cain. And what's happened is the wild beasts around him on the ark were not the threat. It was the wild beasts inside of him, the Cain inside of him that was a threat. So the man who saved the world becomes the occasion for the new fall, for the my, new, my, the new my, corruption. My, my, my. And so when he comes off the ark, he comes off as Abel. He went onto the ark as Abel, but sometime after that, he becomes Cain and plants a vineyard, gets drunk, gets drunk. and then the, the whole horrible story that, that plays out from there, and it ends with a curse, you know, ends with him bringing a curse on his own family. And again and again, Scripture gives us those stories. So I think what's going on in Mark, when he draws up those details of the dove and the water and the heavens, and the wild beasts and the angels, 
he's showing us that Jesus is the only one who can actually bring this judgment about in a way that's redemptive for everyone. Because Jesus doesn't just redeem what's outside of us. He did. Oh, he redeems my, my. what's inside of us, right? He doesn't just save the animals. He saves the animalistic in us, right? He redeems, he redeems that. And I think, I think Mark, again, wants us to see that's what Jesus does, right? He, he doesn't just redeem Cain. I mean, Abel, he redeems Cain and the Cain in, inside of us too. Talk a little bit about, and the angels were ministering to him. You know, I, we, are, we are preoccupied in some circles these days with angels and angelic visitations, but I'm not sure that's always healthy. Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think we end up in danger and avoid and, and ignore many of the passages in the New Testament that guard, are attempted to guarding us against those dangerous practices. But talk a little bit about the angels ministering to Christ and then how does that relate to us? Well, I think it reveals his humility and his, his openness to be cared for. And I, I think this is, one of, this is one of the things we miss about God. In fact, I think it's the thing we miss most about God is that he's humble, that he is holy, but his holiness is revealed in his humility. In, in that he has, one way to put this is God has no ego. He, there's, there's nothing at stake for him. This is why when he's revealed, when he comes among us, he comes among us in utter dependency, right? He's a, he's a baby he's in a the baby. womb, a baby at the breast, right? He's, he's a squalling, dirty, diapered baby. That's God, right? And then from there lives 30 years of silence. No sense of a need to get on. I mean, in that one moment in Luke when he's in the temple at 12, that he can walk away from that. I mean, I, I think we often read that story of Luke, Luke's gospel of him at 12 as you know, confounding all the teachers and think because he's God, he knows things no one else can know. That's not it. It's because he's God, he doesn't have anything at stake in being the smartest person in the room. He can walk away from all that. He can submit to his mom and dad. And it's, it's that humility of God that we miss, which is revealed ultimately in the foot washing in John's gospel. Right, that, that you must let me wash your feet. And he says outright in Mark's gospel, you know, the Gentiles lord it over those who are among them, but that's not how it's going to be with you because I am among you as one who serves. Right, so in Philippians 2, when he has this equality with God, but he doesn't grasp right. it, for it, he becomes human. He takes on the form of a slave. And we always tell that story as if it's a, it's a humiliation. God becomes a slave. But that's not what's happening there. The humiliation is the cross. The humiliation is death. Death is a sinner. But he becomes a slave because slaves, there shouldn't be slavery, but slaves care for other people. They have no identity other than the care of other people. And only that among the world, in the world we've made, only that can reveal the fullness of God. He couldn't have come as a king. He couldn't come in a kingly way because that's too narrow for God. It's too self-concerned. God is revealed as the one who serves. And, and the mind. scandal of the gospel is we're trying to serve a God who's trying to serve us. And we're trying to serve him because we have ambitions about authority, like the disciples. My when you come mind. into your kingdom, give, me, give me us the, 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 throne. the thrones beside you. And he says, you don't understand what you're asking. You want to be baptized. With because God. in my kingdom, the only authority there is, is the authority of, of caring for your neighbor and, and caring for your enemy. And, and all of that, I think, is packed into the story of the temptations. And it's why Jesus ultimately overcomes, is that the devil has no ego to use against Jesus. He can't leverage anything in Jesus against his calling and his humility. And this, this is why the church fathers, the desert fathers, will say humility is the mother of all wisdom and all virtue. If you are humble, you can live the life of God. If you're not humble, you cannot. I mean, that, that is at the essence of it. That, that is it, I think. So how do we, um, how do we live out in a day when it seems to me there is a message that is claimed to be the gospel of we always win. Yeah. We never lose. How do we communicate? This is not Jesus. Yeah. 
Well, it isn't, and that's a false gospel. And I think we just have to call it what it is, right? I mean, it's a that's an accursed gospel. You know, it it's false to the way Jesus lived. It's false to the, what he teaches. I, mean, I I think if we're not careful, we turn Jesus into the one who did what had to be done so we could live a different life than he lived, right? That he he suffers so we don't have to suffer. You know, he obeys so we don't have to obey, right? He bears the cross so we can live in victory. But that's not at all what Jesus has done, right? I mean, what scripture says is he's lived this life so we can live it with him, right? We can live it in him. And you can see this, like, if we go back to Philippians for a moment. I mean, Paul, that's what Paul wants, what he's crying out for, is I want to know him, but not know him in some vague way. I want my life to be conformed to the pattern of his life, which means, Paul says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering and and the power of his resurrection. But here's the thing that we often miss. The power of the resurrection comes first and then the fellowship of his sufferings. Because in the Christian life, to be baptized, to be filled with the Spirit, to be in Christ and Christ in you is to begin the process of being conformed to his image. And that's a process of suffering. That's a process of bearing your cross. And I think the Pentecostal charismatic tradition, we knew this at one time. And somewhere in our history, we lost touch with the goal of life is to be conformed to Christ. And it became the goal of life is to use Christ to make the life we want for ourselves. And, and somehow we've, we've twisted that. Any, any sense of where or when or how? Yeah, I think, I think part of it was, it was tied to an American dream. You know, it's tied to the idea of the self-made man yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, building the life we want for ourselves and Christianity becoming the way, Jesus becoming the way that you get that, right? So we, we had our dream of what we wanted life to be and Jesus became the mechanism to accomplishing that. And I mean, obviously, I think that happens slowly. It, the devil is good at deceiving us, and, and we're not always good at being discerning. So I don't, I don't think there was any one event, but I think that's the shift, at least in the States, that's yeah. the shift that happens, is we, we fall in love with the American dream instead of falling in love with the kingdom of God. And, and we all along we were saying we shouldn't, but we somehow did anyway. Beloved, as we come to a close, I want to invite you to just at this moment ask the Lord to bring you to a place of the humility of wisdom. James speaks of the humility of wisdom. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus bring us to that place of humility for his namesake. Amen. Amen.